Well, you've heard it before, don't mess with Texas. And now that might even be truer than ever before, as the Lone Star State seeks a new gun law. Believe it or not, they are trying to allow more guns out in the open. Ask anyone in America or even overseas, they'll describe a cartoonish caricature. The stereotypical Texan who wears a cowboy hat, rides a pickup truck, and carries a loaded gun. But most people don't realize until now that it's actually illegal to carry any gun out in the open in Texas. It has to be concealed. In fact, that law goes back 140 years. It's one of the only states in the entire country to outlaw open carry handguns. The others are Illinois, California, New York, South Carolina, and Florida. Even though that's only six states, they are home to over one third of the entire country's population. Now that could all change in a big way for people living in Texas. The largest state on the list, if this law goes through, Texans would be free to carry handguns, not just in their purse or concealed in their coat, but right on their hip, right out in the open. Gun advocates say it would be a good thing and making Texas even safer. But gun control activists would be devastated. Overturning a law that is over a century old is no easy task. And we will continue to keep an eye on this story as it heads to a vote in the State House in Austin. Big news on the pharmaceutical forefront. It's a developing story in the case of the Massachusetts compounding pharmacy that was blamed for a nationwide outbreak of deadly fungal meningitis. Federal agents arrest several employees of the New England Compounding Center. For more on this story, let's go to Mark Maxwell, who is reporting from Boston. Thanks, Midge. Here's what we know so far. Federal authorities are confirming, yes, indeed, there have been arrests in connection with the investigation into the New England Compounding Center, the NECC. That's the same pharmacy that distributed these painkillers that were tainted with a deadly fungus. You might recall 64 people died after being exposed to the medicine. More than 750 other people also got sick, and some of those still have not recovered. Among those arrested is Barry Cadden, the operator of the compound pharmacy, also Greg Canigliero and his wife. The deadly meningitis outbreak began in the fall of 2012. Now the case is actually under investigation by the U.S. Attorney's Office and the Justice Department. Now in November of 2012, Cadden was actually called before a congressional hearing. NECC boss pleaded the Fifth Amendment. On advice of counsel, I respectfully decline to answer on the basis of my constitutional rights and privileges. Cadden is one of those arrested Wednesday morning, and as Mark just told us, but at that same hearing, Cadden had to hear the testimony of a wife who lost her husband. Their lack of attention to their duties cost my husband his life. Now, nearly two years later, Joyce Lovelace and her family will finally start to see some closure, at least on some level. Of course, we will follow up on this story as it continues to develop. You, right, you might remember the FDA is caught up in the drama, too. They investigated the NECC three times since 1998 and never even sent a warning letter. Even with all of that, they never actually shut the company down, and many of the victims and the sick patients are out outraged that the FDA didn't do more to prevent this tragedy. The Congressional Committee says the FDA failed to do their job, and it is unclear if anyone in the FDA will also face prosecution. And it's almost official, an excited announcement from former Florida Governor Jeb Bush. On his Facebook page, Bush says Merry Christmas and Happy Hanukkah. And oh, by the way, I have decided to actively explore the possibility of running for president of the United States. Bush says he finally decided to explore the possibilities of running for the White House while eating good food and watching a whole lot of good football with his family during Thanksgiving. He is also setting up a leadership political action committee next month. And aside from raising money for his campaign, he says it will expand opportunity and prosperity for all Americans. 
While this social media announcement stops just short of announcing an official run for president, it is more than likely that this was a message to previous Bush family donors that he means business. He is serious about running and don't get too heavily invested in other candidates. In other news, the hunt for Bradley Stone, the man and former Marine wanted for killing his ex-wife, ends with his suicide. Police found his body in the woods. Prosecutors say a knife was found at the scene and there were no notes left behind, but the DA says she can only speculate. Stone and his wife were locked in a contentious custody battle. She says Stone murdered his former wife and five of her relatives in a crime spree that spanned four different communities. His victims suffered gunshot wounds and knife wounds, and their two daughters are now in protective custody. It's Fed Day on Wall Street and in Washington, where policymakers are wrapping up a two-day meeting. It's all about interest rates and the strength of the economy. The Federal Reserve leaders are trying to gauge if the American consumer can withstand higher interest rates. We could know more about the details very soon as the Federal Reserve releases its statement on the economy. If Chairwoman Janet Yellen announces a rate hike, it would be the first one this country since 2008. Six years now of interest rates. Just before the meeting at the Fed, gold fell 2% as the dollar stabilized. And as we gear up for the holiday season, we're learning some of the most heartwarming stories that we've seen around the country. One of those takes place in Nevada. A sad story looked like it was about to get even worse. 87-year-old Helen Smith got bad news. Her son was on his deathbed all the way across state lines in Utah. In tears, she immediately packed up her bags and got in the car for a 350-mile road trip. Soon after she crossed over into Utah, state trooper picked her up on his radar gun. She was speeding, and sure enough, Officer Jeff Jones pulled her over and issued her a warning. Frazzled and upset, she started to drive off, but she left the car in reverse and backed up right into the squad car. The officer came back to her window, and she was in tears. When he learned about her son and noticed her condition, he realized that she probably shouldn't be driving, but instead of taking her keys, he forgave her for the accident and then went the extra mile. Jones arranged to have her car safely transported back home while he and four other state troopers gave her a high-speed escort the rest of the way to the hospital. Helen's son still isn't doing very well, but she says the holidays will be much better for both of them now that they are together again.